Okay, this video is going to work through the answers to some problems from a Kahoot quiz. This quiz is all about carboxylic acids. If you haven't tried it or you want to try it again, then the address for the Kahoot quiz is in the description of this video down below. So the first question asks, which one of these fragments of a molecule does not correspond to a carboxylic acid? So if we look at A, the first one over here, we know that carbon must have a valency of 4, so it must make 4 bonds. Oxygen must have a valency of 2, so it makes 2 bonds. And hydrogen has a valency of 1, so it makes 1 bond. For all those elements to be happy and to satisfy the octet rule, in the case of carbon and oxygen. So if we've got a carbon with 4 bonds, like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we've got 2 oxygens that have 2 bonds each, like so, and then a hydrogen with one bond, the only way we can get those things together in a formula that is CO2H and satisfy all of the requirements for each one of those atoms is that the carbon must be doubly bonded to an oxygen like this and singly bonded to another oxygen with a hydrogen attached. And then that is the functional group that's attached to the rest of a molecule. So that gives each one of the oxygens two bonds, the carbon four bonds, and the hydrogen one bond. Um, and we sort of try to make this more obvious where the hydrogen is by putting the hydrogen further away from the carbon in the formula so that it sort of shows that it's attached to an oxygen rather than a carbon atom. Similarly, in uh, compound C down here, we've got a carbon with an oxygen and an oxygen and there's a hydrogen attached. So it makes sense that hydrogen must be attached to one of the oxygens. And the valency of the carbon and the oxygen is satisfied by making that a double bond. So that must be the formula for C. If we look at D, it's already written out as a carboxylic acid. So hopefully if you can recognize that functional group there, you can see that that is a carboxylic acid. B, on the other hand, is uh, a little bit trickier. So we've got a carbon and we've drawn it with a hydrogen next to it. So it really implies that the hydrogen, hydrogen is attached to the carbon. Whereas the oxygen, anyway we can get that oxygen into that formula and satisfy all of the valencies for each of the elements is to have a double bond to an oxygen like that. And then that must be an aldehyde functional group. So it's not a carboxylic acid. So this is the one that's not a carboxylic acid. So the answer to the question one is B. Okay, question two is asking which of these molecules is an ester? For it to be an ester, we must have an R group, some kind of carbon-based group, an alkyl or an aryl group, and then a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen, we call that an acyl or acyl group, and then an oxygen, single bond, and then another R group, we could call R prime. Now, if we look at those four molecules, the one that fits that is D. So the answer is D. If we look at A, it has an acyl group, but then it has two oxygens attached to that acyl group. So that doesn't fit. B, we have an acyl group attached to one R group attached to an oxygen, but that oxygen doesn't bond to a simple R group. It, it's bonded to another acyl group. So that uh, group makes this now an acid anhydride, which is not an ester. And then C, we have two R groups attached to an oxygen and no acyl groups, so that must be an ether. Okay, looking at question three, we're now asked the same four molecules, which one is an acid anhydride? So for an acid anhydride, we have an R group attached to a carbonyl group, attached to an oxygen, that then is attached to another carbonyl group, and then another R group, and that could be the same or different to the first R group. So we must have two acyl groups connected through one oxygen atom. And the molecule that fits that is compound B. Now it might be tempting to say that A fits that, but it's the other way around. It's two single bonds between oxygen and the acyl carbon, and only one acyl group. So that's actually called a carbonate. And it's a different functional group to uh, an acid anhydride with different reactivity. So the answer to that question is B. Question four, which one of these is an acid halide? Now for a molecule to be an acid halide, we need to have an acyl group once again, 
and then a halogen directly attached to that carbon that's forming the acyl group. We can't have the halogen attached anywhere else for it to be an acid halide functional group. So if we look at B and C, we've got in this case the acyl group attached to a nitrogen, that's no good. In this case we've got the acyl group attached to two carbon-based groups, R groups, so that's a ketone. D is probably the trickiest one. It has a halogen, but the halogen is not directly bonded to this acyl carbon. And so that's actually a ketone that happens to have a halogen somewhere else in the molecule. So it's a halogenated ketone, but it's still a ketone nevertheless. So the only molecule here that is an acid halide is A. It's actually an acid fluoride or acyl fluoride. So that's the molecule there. Question five, which one of these molecules is an amide? So there's a trick in this one as well. So we can scratch out this one here and that one there. They're an acid halide and a ketone. Now, many people might be tempted to say that C is an amide. However, for the molecule to be an amide, we must have the acyl carbon directly bonded to a nitrogen that then has some other groups bonded to it. And normally they're either hydrogens or carbon-based groups, so alkyl or aryl groups. Uh, now C has carbon-based substituents bonded at, uh, to the acyl group. So it's two R groups bonded to the acyl group. So that's actually a ketone that happens to have a amine functional group within the molecule as well. So it's an, an amino ketone but it's not an amide. B is the amide. It has the carbonyl carbon here bonded directly to a nitrogen. Now it doesn't matter that nitrogen has no hydrogens. We can have amides with either two, one, or zero hydrogens and we classify those as primary, secondary, or tertiary. So this is the only amide amongst that group of compounds. So the answer here is B. Now related to that, question six is asking this particular molecule here is, is an amide, is it a primary, a secondary, a tertiary? And uh, quaternary doesn't make sense because um, there's no such thing as quaternary amides. So we can immediately scratch that one out. Now one point of confusion here might be if you get distracted by the R group that is attached to the amide. When we're classifying amides as primary, secondary, or tertiary, we're only interested in how many hydrogen versus carbon-based groups are attached to the nitrogen. So in this case we've got two hydrogens and zero carbon-based groups or R groups. And when we have that arrangement with zero alkyl groups we call that a primary amide. So the answer here is the first one there. Doesn't matter what is happening over here in this R group that's not how we talk about the amide in terms of primary, secondary, or tertiary. Question seven, name this compound. So with a carboxylic acid, it's really important that we start numbering at the carbon that's part of the carbonyl or the carbox carboxylate group. So that's number one there. Number two is here, and then we keep on numbering along the longest chain. So we don't go for this position here because that's not the next carbon in the longest chain. The longest chain goes out this way. So we have a four carbon chain. If that was a alkane, that would be butane. So with a carboxylic acid, it becomes butanoic acid. Okay, and then the group that is attached is a one carbon group. So that becomes a methyl butanoic acid. And the methyl group is attached to the two position. So it's two methyl butanoic acid. The most common mistakes in naming this compound is that people, some students will start to number at the carbon atom next door to the carboxylic acid, which is not correct, and some students will forget to go along the longest chain. So it's really important that we do both those things. So it's 2-methyl butanoic acid. So that's the answer there. Question 8. What is a typical pKa for a carboxylic acid? So a pKa of uh, 1 to 2 would be a very quite a strong acid, so uh, much stronger than a normal carboxylic acid with no electron withdrawing group. So this would be maybe a carboxylic acid with a number of electron withdrawing fluorines attached to it, like trifluoroacetic acid. Four to five is the typical range for 
a uh, ordinary carboxylic acid. So uh, acetic acid has a pK of 4.74. So if you remember that one, then you'll have a good yardstick for remembering other carboxylic acids. 8 to 9 and 14 to 15 are much weaker acids. So 14 to 15 is getting down more towards the range of pKs for just alcohols. In fact, alcohols are more like 16. Okay, so question nine. Now we're looking at a reaction here. This is an ester, and we're treating it with a strong base, sodium hydroxide, in water, which is classical conditions for hydrolysis, or what's also called saponification. Okay, so under these conditions, we're going to hydrolyze the ester into an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. And that's the bond that's going to break. So whenever we have an ester and we hydrolyze it, we break across that bond here to make an alcohol on this side. And on the other side, we're going to have a carboxylic acid. Uh, but under the basic conditions, the carboxylic acid is going to then be deprotonated. So we're going to have the carboxylate uh, conjugate base of the carboxylic acid. So the two components are going to be, firstly, the carboxylate will be that right-hand portion. Okay, and it's going to be as the um, conjugate base. And then the left-hand portion is going to be the alcohol. So I'll draw that in blue. And there it is there. So that's benzyl alcohol. So we know what the two components are going to be. And then we're asked, well, after we've done the reaction, we then add an organic solvent, diethyl ether, which is very nonpolar and is not miscible with water. So we get two different layers. We shake those two layers and we get partitioning of the components in the mixture between those two layers. So we get the molecules that are very nonpolar will um, and hydrophobic will partition mostly into the diethyl ether layer. And the hydrophilic or very water soluble compounds will partition mainly into the aqueous layer, the water layer. And so when the layers separate, we know that water is heavier than diethyl ether, and so we get the aqueous layer on the bottom and the organic layer at the top. And we'll find that the benzyl alcohol will be in the um, organic layer. So that will go mostly into the organic layer, which is diethyl ether, and the benzoate anion will go mostly mostly into the aqueous layer because that's the sodium um, salt and so salts tend to be very water soluble and not very soluble in organic solvents like diethyl ether and so the correct answer here is that benzyl alcohol prefers to be dissolved in the organic layer and the sodium benzoate prefers to dissolve in the aqueous layer so this is the uh, best answer there and finally, question 10, we're asked, in this reaction, we've got an unknown component here that reacts with an amine to create an amide. So there is the product, and the side product is HCl. So if we look at this, we're going to get the amine comes from this molecule here, plus some kind of carboxylic acid derivative over here, which is going to have a methyl group attached to it. So it's just going to be that methyl group there. And we're going to end up with chlorine coming from this component uh, to make this byproduct here. Because in going from this amine to the amide, we've lost one of these two hydrogen atoms to create this byproduct. So overall, this uh, acid derivative must be the acid chloride. We know that acid chlorides react very quickly with amines to give amides like this. So the acid chloride is D here. It's not going to be the carboxylic acid. It's not going to be an ester. And it's certainly not going to be this dichloroalkyl uh, compound. So the correct answer here is uh, D, compound D, acetyl chloride. Okay, so hopefully you found that useful in terms of revising carboxylic acids and the derivatives. If anything wasn't clear, then leave a comment in the comments below. And if you've got any suggestions for other videos you'd like me to do, then also put them in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, thanks for watching.